And that is that understanding European energy policy requires something of understanding what one might call a European culture. First question, why should people in the U.S. care what people in Europe are doing? Three big reasons always come up. Trade is one. The economists are very concerned with that. We'll get a few numbers in a moment here. And right now, especially with ISIS doing the sorts of things ISIS is doing, and Russia doing the sorts of things that the Russian Federation is doing, we have to be concerned about security. And another uh, area to be concerned with, though, is common culture. Has anybody here ever heard the phrase that the United Kingdom has a special relationship with the United States? I see some smiling people in the What's that mean? We have a lot of common That's an important one, I think. This language thing possibly makes a more special relationship than anything else. If we look at allies historically, I know everybody got their feathers ruffled when France didn't want to join us. Uh, in 2001, but the French have been our ally militarily a lot more often than the English have. Okay, but we do have a special relationship with the UK, which, despite what we were heard about things, is a part of Europe. <laughs> Let's look at trade for a moment. The EU exports more to the United States than anywhere else, including China. It imports uh, more from China than the United States. Nobody can stop China from exporting more to them than anyone else. But its total trade in export and import is still more with the U.S. than anywhere else. It's almost the same percentage of total trade, but its trade balance with the United States is we are in deficit to that. They own a trade uh, plus with us. They're in a deficit with China. They're importing more from China. So our number one trading partner is the European Union. Their number one trading partner is us. That's the reason we care what they're doing. There is something uh, from political science Anybody want to tell us about the uh, transatlantic agreement on tariffs and trade? This will look like uh, GATS, or it will look like NAFTA, but it's going to be between Europe and the United States. It'll be years before we finish this. But this is on our way right now. Uh, the benefit of such an agreement would be that we would have a reduced tariff agreement. So when we do all the importing and exporting that we just looked at in the last slide, that would be at a reduced tariff with the 28 member states of Europe and Europe on the whole. One of the things in an energy discussion we have to be thinking about is what fits under energy in a trade. Also, the security issue. If you are thinking about the so-called world war, or we came in late, only with our special relationship with Britain, uh, invited us to get involved. Uh, just recently, in fact, just uh, last week, uh, Eric Burton published an article uh, from the Atlantic Council Think Tank in Washington. He said there are many geopolitical reasons for the U.S. to help wean Europe off its emission uh, to Russian oil and gas. Energy we included in the airport and negotiations on the transatlantic air and gas Okay, now comes the difficult conceptual part. Uh, at the beginning, how did the European Union? Begin as a legal entity. Winston Churchill, cleverly as a Brit, said, these European wars keep starting because Germany and France can't play in the sandbox together. And it's not our fault as the English. So you two fixed it. He made a famous speech at the University of Missouri in 1949, in which he said, there is a quotation of thought, there is a remedy to the war, which would in a few years make all of Europe free and happy, is to recreate the European family for as much as we can provided for the structure which is involved in well peace, and safety, and freedom, and here comes the most famous statement. We must build a kind of United States of Europe. And you're thinking about well, the United States of America. Uh, for the lawyers in the room in public law, we have to think about what that means to American sovereignty. He was already suggesting that these states that keep fighting each other might be give up a bit of that. That is still the reason for the European Union. And the soon to be exiting president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, has always said, when asked, is the European Union working? Which is usually a question raised by economic critics. Because of course it's working, we haven't had another world war. But that's the purpose of the European Union. It's far too often forgotten. So if you want to think about what is the policy, big policy at the top of the hierarchy for the European Union, it would be to use economics law, politics, trade, including energy, to maintain peace. That's what it said it invented itself to do, and that's what it continues to want to do. Uh, 
Schumann, who was the first president of the European Parliamentary Assembly the institution that then became a further institution, he said, once we invented this thing called the European Union, over and above being a military or economic alliance, it must be a cultural community in the highest sense. And he's one of the architects of it. Now, as I said earlier, these, these questions about what makes a cultural community be difficult. But the two points we made so far regarding Europe is it was invented to stop war, and the glue that was going to hold it together was to identify it as a family or a cultural unity, not to do it with uh, colony measures. That's very difficult for Congress. Jean Monnet said, and he was the first president of the high authority, that you don't fall in love with a currency. There must be something more. It's long before there was the group. His point was, solving a financial unity of the states wasn't going to bring everybody together. There had to be more than that. Either, does either Europe or the United States have any unified one thing that one could say, this is our energy policy against which we do negative this evidence? We go all over the place in that in the United States, and frankly, Europe isn't a whole lot better insofar as there isn't just one place to go and look at the document or one line with the document and say, here is European energy policy measure everything against it. Because like the United States, it's in part answered by agents of economics, agents of law, agents of politics, defense departments, and war departments, and all of that form part of it. So there isn't any one answer to that makes it. I would make it further further um, proviso that I will therefore say European energy policy, for the reasons I said, can be understood insofar as it can fit within European energy law. Uh, the European Union is established by treaties. One of the treaties that exists right now, a constitutional treaty, one that really sets up the framework of our works, is called the Treaty on European Union, TEU. And what it says in the TEU establish policy about energy. The union shall establish an internal market, it shall work for the sustainable development of Europe based on balanced economic growth and possibility, and here's the part that's why I don't want to do it, a highly competitive social market economy. If there are economists in the room, especially if you do macroeconomics, that ought to send our big bell. That's very different than what we do in the United States. So I would suggest that cultural distinction number one is that Europe apparently is comfortable with a social market economy. And they're going to understand their energy policy within a social market economy. This legal entity known as the European Union, and this is my mid-time, my mid-time, my mid time you. The character, as I said, began in the 1950s, you saw my quotations from John Lennon and Robert Schumann, uh, is that they wanted to develop a cold and steel community so that the machinery of war of France and Germany could develop could be controlled. So one of the treaties focused on what you do with cold and steel. Uh, the other was on atomic energy with a sideways look to atomic weaponry, your atom. And the other was the European Economic Community. Notice again why the European Economic Community is only one of three treaties, and its purpose is to facilitate prevention of the Third World War. That's why you those treaties share institutions. The institutions and the legal instruments of the European Union are parallel to what we do in U.S. law. There's not a legislative, judicial, and executive branch of government. Montesquieu's model is not in effect there. Therefore, the institutions created are not legislative, judicial, and executive. Instead, they make a commission, a council, a parliament, and a court of court. That would look like something you know. But doing the two functions, making law and enforcing law, they've got three entities doing it. Here is how they're different. This is a cultural thing once again. They are different because the commission is elected to legislate and execute, but who does it represent? Europe as one entity. As a federation. It's not a federation. It's a federation. That's what makes the commission different than the others. The council are the ministers of the various states for whatever the issue today is. On a day that's energy, if they have a minister of energy, it's 
28 ministers of energy come together. If the issue is taxation, then the 28 ministers of taxation come together. So there isn't any one group of people for all times and places who are the council. That's a rotating body. But the important, important thing there is they represent the member states. If I'm a minister of finance or taxation for Belgium, when I go to the Council of Ministers, my job is to represent the Belgian ones out of this. But if I sit on the Commission, I in fact have to take an oath that I will represent the interests of Europe and not the interests of my own country. So they do the same thing. They make law and enforce law, but they do it representing different people than yeah. the Commission does. The Parliament early on the Parliament was kind of played dress up. But the Parliament in subsequent treaties, uh, Maastricht and Nice, has developed as much power as anyone else, they are elected to legislate and execute on behalf of the country for the law. It's five or eight. There's half a billion people in Europe. So on behalf of the 500 million people in Europe, they are representing each and every one for what their interests are in Europe. <coughs> so you've got three groups all doing the same thing. You say, why do we need three? Because they all represent a different piece of what Europe is. That's not all we do. And so it comes out very differently. That's not how the member states mostly do things. Most these European sources of law now, what those institutions do that I just showed you, look like this. That doesn't look like our time. They have treaties which take the place of our constitution, so they're called constitutive treaties. They have specific treaties. If they want to sign a treaty with the United States, like the Free Trade Agreement, that's not a constitutive treaty, that's just a treaty on trade. They get another one in Algeria on oil. So the specific treaties. Their secondary legislation is what I was commenting on earlier um, to my colleagues from Mazda. Uh, surprisingly, is that all wrong? Directives and regulations. Directives are when the Commission, the Council, and the Parliament get together in whatever the voting system is for that issue, because they differ on issues. And they say, hey, you European member state, the one of the 28 states. This is what you must do to achieve a goal, and this is your deadline. And if you go back home and do whatever your parliament or your uh, monarchy or your president says you must do to achieve that, it's up to you. So. Those institutions I talked about, so we have the commission, only 28 commissioners in my life, but they have 23,000 staff who are living all over the world for an aspect of energy policy in this way. They propose legislation. So when my colleague is talking about the commission made of law, that's a, that's a nonsense. That's a no The council, in representing the member states, has these odd ways of voting that uh, are no different. There's an easy way to remember it. In fact, our House of Representatives is weighted by population versus the Senate, which is not in the United States only. The council is the same. It's qualified majority of Bigger states get more votes than the council. It has to be unanimous only on relatively few areas. Taxation, social security, green new states in, which happens over time, it started off in 2006, now it's 2008, defense policy, and police cooperation. Most of the legislation today is in terms of parliament and also together. The parliament's 751 members is the second largest parliamentary body in the world. Uh, it goes by majority. It cannot introduce legislation. So you see these different pieces of the, of the system that represent different pieces of Europe only in a limited function. They must work in a function. They don't have congressional written law. So as a consequence, you can only talk about what the countries will do if you're talking about a directive, and you cannot talk about what the countries will do if you're talking about treaties or regulations.
to be read here because both the union of the Brussels and 20 individual states are legislative. How do we decide when which is which? All of us. That's not legally determined. When it comes to health and safety, the union usually takes over. And they say that, or the, excuse me, the union usually relinquishes and says the states may go ahead and do what's all the same. So the question then, was the EU desire to adopt the U.S. energy standard a question of trade or the environment? You don't have to answer this by looking at, well, what are they actually going to do? It will tell us what it is. It will be an observable fact with evidence. It's a matter of making a decision and the decision itself might not be about the thing, it's about who we want to be making the law on this. The 28 member states or the union on the whole. And that will depend on which piece of the government we do. So I hope you're seeing with this is when you look at European energy policy, you're looking at something that doesn't have not this piece of for its own government. And the battles that are fought are in some ways impenetrable to us if you don't look to see how they in fact can make law in which policy. Few economic observations. I don't sit on this here. I know you are. In the United States, this is sort of the domain of the American being the University of Cincinnati School of Law. So I can rely on my authorities here. As well as other capitalist democracies, government policymakers begin thinking about society when they make their premise to the free market as preferred. Remember what I said it says in the European Constitution? It's a social market economy. Those are two very different premises from which to begin. Legislating that goes through different institutions, also, and making sources of law that don't look the same either. So when we start comparing, and why should we care about European energy policy with U.S. energy policy? We've got to keep all this in mind. We're really comparing apples and orange. Whether it's going to be useful or not is still going to be the same. Federal Republic of Germany has been criticized as U.S. creation because it's the only economy that's popular. And its constitution looks a lot like the US Constitution, so that the amendments come first, the individual rights come first, and then come the function of the state. Nevertheless, it also, as a member state, it's not Europe on the whole, it's not this big 500 million people block, this is just one state, the 500 million people also has a basic assumption that it's a social market economy. And you would find this again and again and again throughout the years the member state. So when you start talking about energy policy, and if you just do read like I do in Dabu, to get a sense of what people are thinking, all you need the economics of this. When you start talking about energy policy in Europe, it starts with concerns for, if they want to give it over to member states, health and safety, and the states can say yes or no. And if they want to keep it an issue of trade, and they make a European wide issue for the commission. So we can't just begin with the assumption, well, of course it's an economics issue, and we will do what we do best for economics, and hope that's good for the environment, and hope that's good for labor, and health and safety, and that In the treaty uh, on the functioning of the European Union, it, as I said before, says that it's a social economy. Finish up here by looking at uh, the U.S. doesn't have, as I said earlier, a top policy, and if it has a policy, can anybody be closed? Like, it's two examples of the Republican and the Democrat. In our spectrum of politics, we'd like to say that very far right and very far left. The Europeans would say they're both on the two sides of the center, but they are right and left. Neither one of them could do what they wanted to do. Carter wanted to regulate, and Reagan wanted to dismantle energy regulation. They pushed hard, and he had big political clouds to do so, and nothing moved. <coughs> So we have to ask ourselves the question, going back to my definition of policy, if you'll forgive me, what can we observe from that? Policy is not the top-down vision of the president. Policy is probably 19th century oil and gas industry doing what it has always done. And the politicians that we elect have a very difficult time, regardless of which direction we back them on, on moving away from that. Because, and it's not even a conscious economic decision always, this laissez-faire idea that we're going to keep doing what we've been doing because, hey, we want those two world wars. We have a world leading economy. It must be okay. But if we start getting issues with uh, health and environment or security or 
trade deficit, we might need to think about it in a major way. In weird ways, Europe has benefited from the two world wars. I think this is one of them. These cataclysmic, catastrophic interruptions in how the governments function and how people thought about economics forced them to think things anew. We have 130 years worth of energy practice since we started doing our energy practice that has developed a world policy. They don't have that. So they're putting in current thinking rather than just going along the way we have. New people would ask about this. Shale gas, it's physically in there. The poles are going for it. The poles are going for it because they're stuck between um, two enemies. Uh, the Russians, the Ukrainians, and the Germans. And there's a nice story in one of the history professors here who told me this, and I always forget. There was a Polish general who was one time asked, if you have to fight a two-front war against the Russians and the Germans at the same time, where are you going to put your army? And he thought about it. He said, against Germany. He said, why? He said, business will be better. <laughs> so if you're Poland, you've got this massive shale gas reserve sitting there, and you don't want to trust Russia, and you're afraid of Germany, you're going to go over the shale gas and follow the United States is doing so that you can be a bridge partner with whatever the U.S. is doing to make you a security independent state. Britain, Special relationships so they behave like this. So they're going for it. They just don't want to be part of Europe. But every opportunity they have to say we're not part of Europe, they do something different. Germany has a moratorium against it. You may know that in January of this year, the European Commission attempted to pass legislation to prohibit shale gas exploration. Britain politically stopped it. You go back to the voting that I showed you earlier, they were capable of doing so. But in stopping it, then the European Commission went forward and passed a piece of legislation that required every state within six months to report on what it was going to do if it explored to care for the health, safety, and drinking water of the public. Germany on the 4th of July submitted its report and said, What are we going to do? More authority. So this is what it looks like now. That's what we can do now. Germany looks like it's contrary to what I'm saying about the Green Peak. That's one because they do old track exploration. World energy production, the EU, uh, if you compare it, is about China's energy production. Uh, and then we have, um, most importantly for me, I mean, I listed about China here, most importantly for me, if you look at the number, the number is going down. Why is the number going down in European energy production? In part because they're giving for you, but they will tell you it's a large part. Consumption by region, if we look at it again, should also be opened up. And if you adjust the population, in fact, it is also the cost of going down. Compare it to China, where the consumption between 95 and 2,000 has doubled, compared to the United States, will be about 10% increase in the same period of time. So, insofar as these folks making European law and carrying out European policy, say we want more efficient today. Ten years ago, the numbers suggest that they're telling the truth. Break down the consumption by region of the world, then, um, in the picture graph, it's easy to see. Kind of looks like this. Uh, the E is using about 30% of the energy. It's measured in um, billions of uh, tons of oil. Let's move on to the world statistics in Europe's position to us in Europe. And this might be a little blurry for you to read, but I just want to refer to these net imports here, total production here. And this is 1995, voting time of oil equipment, so it's 2012. Here we have 922, go back to net imports, 754. They are increasing imports, which is kind of a thing security. This is why the net comes. The 
total production by comparison here in 1995, 1964, and then we go forward, it has uh, dropped, in fact. So not only they need more imports because they're using it more, they're producing less. So they've got to be more efficient, but they've got a massive uh, energy uh, import that is the Where do they import from? And they said to Russia, import from Norway. Norway makes more all the water through gravity is producing 100% of the energy. Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Libya, Kazakhstan. Natural gas imports, again, falls almost the same order. Um, but I've mentioned to some of the center. Algeria is one of the natural gas uh, export countries. If you believe not think about it, it's the third one that exports natural gas to Europe. Solar fuels, look, and again, Russia, and the conversation I had with the same person at dinner, was about the taking portions of one year as well. Then comes the United States. Here's another reason why we should be thinking about this. They're already important when we're told. This would be the way to switch to shale production. Use the shale production for energy independence and still keep buying the coal to adjust prices and keep the industry going because Europe would buy the coal. It's a possibility based on their uh, current pattern. Consumption by sector, where they're using all this energy for. 2009, you can see it was a third of transport, approximately a third of their households, and then the services industry. The change then about the sources they've been using, uh, consumption by fuel between 1990 and the present, coal has. Germany 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.
going to get this phase here, where the grid is into pooling of other people, is going to be supplying energy. Uh, but then, starting uh, about the other night in the morning, you are going to get solar generation at the same time you're able to charge. We'll talk about see from this energy production in Germany, like I said, total sources, get that down. Through this whole process that we're looking at, you can make how it's actually more efficient if you don't need raw materials to the back of work. Energy production here, and one of the public assets earlier, one of the using probably is the soft coal here. Uh, that's the biggest part. The renewables help them with the farmers to be able to solve the work. This is our humans, 25 to 26 percent. These are the new energy levels. Hold on for the keys. You have the In the European context, one might analogize the inability of 
Greece or to conceptualize the economy? It can't. I know that part of the and she says this all the time. It will take two generations of people to die in Greece before they can fix the economy because people just can't figure out in their head how to live in a way that the economy can work. I would suggest to you something that I hinted at earlier. If we think we're going to go forward in U.S. energy policy through what we've been doing since the drinks well, and just sort of let things go along with a band-aid here and a band-aid there, I think we've already been comfortable with suggesting that's probably not going to work. So a reconceptualization is probably a necessary problem. Europe may not be, and I'm not here to tell you that Europe is that answer. But Europe is an example of one current that may or may not fit the power culture. Isolating cause and effect phenomena, which um, natural scientists and social scientists <laughs> love to do, as do lawyers. Uh, is also based upon a faulty assumption that the culture wants to cherry pick things from another culture. So remember from food, the idea that we want to take on an energy policy 